From real-life romance to queer reunions and real-life on-set romance, there's a lot more to Chucky than stabbing, voodoo, and overalls. Is he really a good guy after all? Chucky's character design has been remarkably consistent over the decades. Sure, his plastic mug has had a few edits here and there, but overall, his look has remained undeniably reliable. Flaming red hair, denim overalls, and of course, those icy, piercing blue peepers, which are the same color as those of Charles Lee Ray actor Brad Dourif. Chucky's ice blue eyes, as well as the rest of his look, were designed by creature effects artist Kevin Yeager, who worked on the first three Child's Play films. One of Yeager's other iconic creations is the ghoulish, pun-loving host of the HBO anthology series Tales from the Crypt, who shares a certain feature in common with Chucky. Indeed, lodged inside the Crypt Keeper's sunken skull are a pair of expressive blue eyes that once belonged to a certain good guy. Now that's entertainment! The list of spooky predecessors who inspired Chucky is nothing to scoff at, and his creators are more than eager to cite their sources. One inspiration for the good guy toys was an interactive talking doll named Corky, whose voice actor Edon Gross provided the good guy friendly voice. There are also striking similarities between the good guy design and Hasbro's My Buddy doll, as well as the iconic Cabbage Patch Kids. The creators also drew inspiration from some notable fictional killer dolls, including Taki Tina from an episode of the Twilight Zone series and the notorious Zuni Warrior doll from the Amelia segment of the 1975 TV film Trilogy of Terror. While not a direct inspiration, it's also worth mentioning Chucky's real-life counterpart. Dressed as a sailor and standing at 40 inches tall, Robert the Doll was supposedly infused with black magic and voodoo by a disgruntled family maid. The rumored laundry list of creepy occurrences associated with Robert includes the doll wandering around in the middle of the night, rearranging furniture, and terrorizing family pets. How many special effects technicians do you need to operate the puppet of a deranged killer doll possessed by the soul of a serial killer? The answer, at least when it comes to the original 1988 Child's Play, is 11, as executive producer David Kirshner revealed to Mental Floss in 2019. The puppet featured in about half of the film was radio-controlled, and it utilized animatronic techniques that were considered groundbreaking at the time. Meanwhile, three-foot, six-inch performer Ed Gale was used for broader, less subtle movements. One of Chucky's puppeteers was N. Brock Winkless IV, who also worked on Tales from the Crypt. The presence of puppeteers and practical character effects work more broadly has since become a trademark of the series. While some CGI has made its way into the franchise over the years, on-set puppets continue to play an integral part. But when action-packed wide shots are required, Chucky has been portrayed by short-statured actors and children. The most prolific of them is Ed Gale, who appeared in the original film as well as Child's Play 2 and Bride of Chucky. One other notable Chucky stunt double in the first movie was Alex Vincent's kid sister Ashley, whom you can spot sprinting around the apartment terrorizing Maggie the babysitter. Have you ever noticed how famous assassins and serial killers often go by three names like John Wayne Gacy, John Wilkes Booth, and Mark David Chapman? It's perhaps fitting, then, that the full government name of the murderous Child's Play villain follows a similar pattern as we know him as Charles Lee Ray. Abbreviated to the less wordy Chucky once he's in doll form, Charles Lee Ray's human name comes from three different prolific killers — cult leader Charles Manson, John F. Kennedy assassin Lee Harvey Oswald, and Martin Luther King Jr. assassin James Earl Ray. With a nasty moniker cobbled together from three real-life killers, Charles Lee Ray sounds evil for good reason. When you think about it, a collaboration between Chucky and a certain French robot-headed electronic duo feels like a match made in heaven, or perhaps hell. Indeed, if you're a Daft Punk fan, there's a good chance that you've had a peek under Chucky's skin without even realizing it. The band's music video for their song, Technologic, features a series of pitch-altered phrases that seem to have originated from a malicious doll with exposed circuitry and false teeth. As the wire-clad freak barks various technological orders, a seemingly more naive skinless robot flanked by the robot duo looks on in awe. Considering that the video for Technologic came out in 2005, just one year after Seed of Chucky, it seems likely that this particular skinless monster was created by Tony Gardner and the crew over at Altarian Inc. Gardner has worked numerous Chucky projects, as well as other Daft Punk collaborations. 
Every fan of the Child's Play franchise loves Brad Dourif's raspy, profanity-filled vocal performance as Chucky. But even though he sounds perfect now, his casting wasn't always part of the plan. Before Dourif signed on for the original film, the casting team originally had someone very different in mind. Believe it or not, Jessica Walter, who's probably best known as Lucille Bluth from Arrested Development, almost voiced the killer doll. As director Tom Holland revealed to Mental Floss in 2019, she could make the threats work, but not the humor, so we went back to Brad. If that's a veiled criticism about me, I won't hear it and I won't respond to it. The attempt at female casting was actually inspired by one of the most successful horror films of all time. As longtime series writer Don Mancini revealed on the Child's Play DVD commentary track, Tom's logic was that the voice of the devil was done by a woman in The Exorcist. The debate over whether on-screen violence inspires real-life violence is an age-old one. As legendary director John Carpenter put it at a 2007 Tribeca Film Festival panel, real life causes violent acts, fake life does not. Censorship never works. You can hide, you can try to cover it up, but you can't destroy it. One particular study from 2009 actually seemed to suggest that horror movies may help stop violent crimes. But there are still some people in the real world who take the concept of life-imitating art to disturbing new lows. With that in mind, it's worth noting that in the early 90s, Child's Play 3 was cited as the inspiration for the killings of Suzanne Capper and James Bulger in the United Kingdom. In response to those tragedies, director Tom Holland told The Independent that people who are inspired to commit crimes by horror movies were, quote, unbalanced to begin with. In the original 1988 Child's Play, Charles Lee Ray uses a voodoo prayer to transfer his soul into the plastic prison of a nearby good guy doll. Over the course of the franchise, other practitioners employ the chant for similar purposes to aid Chucky in his quest to cheat death. But Chucky's abuse of voodoo magic wasn't always part of the plan. The script was at one point titled Blood Buddy, and in this version, the doll wasn't possessed by the voodoo-transferred soul of a serial killer. As Don Mancini explained to Mental Floss, it was a manifestation of a little boy's unconscious rage, his id. To explain how the doll came to life, Mancini devised an especially gruesome scenario. As he revealed, if you play too rough with him, his latex skin would break and he'd bleed this red substance. So you'd have to buy special bandages. So the boy Andy, in a rite of brotherhood, cuts his thumb and mixes it with the doll's blood. And that's the catalyst that brings the doll to life. This idea was ultimately nixed, and as executive producer David Kirshner explained, I wasn't sure anybody would buy a doll with blood in it. You doll? Keeping score of how many people die in horror movies might be a disturbing hobby, but that's what slasher movies are all about. With eight films as of 2023, Chucky certainly holds his own with the deadliest of his slasher peers. According to a tally calculated by Screen Rant, he's racked up a total of 67 confirmed kills. That's not quite as many as other horror icons like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, but Chucky nevertheless still stands head and shoulders above many of his peers, even if that's not literally the case. One villain whom he's notably deadlier than is interdimensional hell priest Pinhead from Hellraiser, which is certainly an accomplishment for a serial killer trapped in a two-foot-tall doll body. Any fan of the franchise of course knows about the fourth film, Bride of Chucky, in which Chucky infamously gets lucky. But do you also know about the real-life romance inspired by Child's Play? In the original 1988 film, Katherine Hicks plays Karen Barclay, mother of Andy. During production, she met Kevin Yeager, special effects makeup artist and creator of the Chucky doll, and the two of them promptly hit it off. In a 2020 interview with ABC7, Yeager recalled that he'd been scheduled to do Hicks' makeup, but she eventually nixed the idea as she was secretly afraid of letting a cute guy see her skin so closely. But it eventually all worked out as they got married in May of 1990, and they're still going strong after more than 30 years of marriage. They have a daughter named Caitlin, and it's safe to say that no other couple can beat them when they talk about how they found love in the strangest place. Chucky was never exactly meant to be gay by design, but the franchise really took a campy, queer-coded turn in 1998's Bride of Chucky. And we have openly gay Chucky creator Don Mancini to thank for that. Those subtle queer vibes were really brought to the forefront in the 2004 follow-up Seed of Chucky. That film features our favorite killer doll fathering a non-binary child named Glenn Glenda, a nod to Ed Wood's notorious 1953 film Glenn or Glenda. As Jennifer Tilly recalled to Pride Source in 2017, Universal said, Seed of Chucky is too funny, it's too gay. Don just basically had a carnival of fun with that movie. 
While the next two sequels, 2013's Curse of Chucky and 2017's Cult of Chucky, played things a little more straight, the franchise returned to a gender-fluid space when the character of Nika became possessed by the soul of Charles Lee Ray. At the conclusion of Cult, Nika, possessed by Chucky, kisses Tiffany in human form before driving off into a snow-filled, non-existent sunset. So this is different. I don't know. Works for me. In October 2021, the gruesome good guy got his very own TV series for the first time in his decade-spanning career. Sci-Fi's and USA Network's Chucky follows the continuity of the Child's Play movies overseen by longtime series writer Don Mancini, and the cast features several old returning favorites from the films. In general, the show is more serious and more tonally in line with the first two films. It's set in a sleepy small town and revolves around a teenage artist named Jake, played by Zachary Arthur. After Jake unwittingly purchases the possessed doll at a yard sale, the murders are quick to follow. A second season aired in 2022, and it's enjoyed favorable critical reviews. The third season debuts in October 2023. Father-daughter acting duo Brad and Fiona Doriff have appeared on screen in the Child's Play universe multiple times, and the Chucky TV show offers an all-new twist to this collaboration. Fiona first appeared in the franchise as the terminally unlucky Nika Pierce, who was the final girl in Curse of Chucky and the final girl possessed by Chucky in Cult of Chucky. On the Chucky TV show, the title doll is still living rent-free in Nika's mind, and watching Fiona play both Nika and the Chucky-possessed Nika is a treat to behold. And there's a flashback scene in season one featuring Fiona in which Charles Lee Ray meets Tiffany that's truly mind-blowing. Fiona already looks a lot like her dad to begin with, but she's styled to look exactly how he did when he first played Charles in the original Child's Play. Brad then dubbed Fiona's dialogue for the scene, and the result is demented and delightful. As Fiona explained to Bloody Disgusting, it's like an Instagram face mash app, except you can't get it off. I FaceTimed my dad as my dad. It was really weird. That's all I got. It's weird. <laughs> I'm Tiffany. I'm Charles. Don Mancini set out to expand Chucky's audience to young adults with the Chucky TV show. Part of that goal is accomplished by lacing a sweet gay love story between two teens into the heart of the show, as well as by showing how the bullied ultimately triumph over their bullies. As Mancini explained to Den of Geek in 2021, the culture of bullying that exists in recent years among today's youth is in itself a true-life horror story. We use Chucky as a metaphor, as the ultimate bully. He is charming and he's funny. Bullies can appear to us in that guise and be seductive. Throughout the course of the Child's Play series, Chucky tries to get kids who feel oppressed some relief by letting them help him kill their oppressors. It works out in Chucky's bloody favor about half the time, but the real triumph comes from watching the teens like Jake resist Chucky's lure to the dark side. As Mancini told The Advocate, when Chucky ends up in a kind of weird, toxic bullying relationship with Jake, one of the ways he's able to manipulate this kid is by ironically expressing a kind of empathy and sympathy for him. Chucky might not exactly be a true ally, but as Mancini explains, he's not homophobic and he's not a bigot. He's an equal opportunity killer. The ins and outs of Chucky's seemingly immortal soul can get a little confusing, especially when the heroes are faced with multiple Chuckies. Whether slivers of Charles Lee Ray's soul are showing up in good guy dolls, surviving victims, or an entire army, the mythology behind how all of this works isn't always clear. But Don Mancini has at least clarified that Chucky's manifestations are distinct and not one entity. An army of Chuckies always appealed to him, though, as he admitted to Bloody Disgusting. It's definitely not a hive mind. He further explained, I considered both avenues when I started putting this together. It's something that I wanted to do for a while. Once you get into your fourth decade in a franchise, it's trying to forge ahead into unseen, unexplored territory. So all of the various versions of Chucky are all different sides of the same killer coin. According to Mancini, one reason for this is to showcase Brad Dourif's varied performances. As he explained, we're dissecting the persona of Chucky and the persona of Charles Lee Ray. We have many different versions of that in the season, and many different actors playing Charles Lee Ray or Chucky. Get back in your boxes, all of you! Chucky is a killer doll who refuses to die, and he's also kept plenty of character actors' careers alive. When Jennifer Tilly heard about the Chucky TV show, she expected her part in it to just be a cameo. Instead, Don Mancini wrote her a deep and layered character that essentially rebooted her career. On the show, Tilly plays Tiffany Valentine, as well as a fictionalized version of herself, and the series even dramatizes the bloody first meeting between Tiffany and Charles Lee Ray. 
Tiffany's journey through death and destruction, and maybe even better romantic choices, is one that the real Tilly is thankful for. As she revealed to Bloody Disgusting, Sometimes you get put in a box when you're an older actress. I don't know what parts there are for all the women, because I never get offered them. Don and I are of similar age. I'm one of his best friends, so we hang out all the time. He just sees me as Jennifer. Tiffany is just this really campy character that's a killer, but has a very good fashion sense. I liked that he gave her some really dramatic scenes this season and last, and you can dig your teeth into her. Chucky is constantly reinventing himself, from hardcore slasher in the original Child's Play to gothic romance in Bride of Chucky and all the horror comedy hijinks of Cult of Chucky and Seed of Chucky, Don Mancini is clearly not afraid to explore new approaches. So it's both a total surprise and no surprise at all that one episode of the Chucky series acts as a standalone Agatha Christie-style murder mystery. Episode 4 of Season 2, entitled Death on Denial, is the whodunit in question. It comes complete with multiple celebrity guest stars who all point the finger, and possibly the butcher knife. That guest cast includes Jennifer Tilly's Bound co-stars Gina Gershon and Joe Pantoliano, as well as her real-life sister Meg Tilly. As Mancini revealed to Entertainment Weekly, Jennifer was, not surprisingly, extremely instrumental in helping put all of that together. I had coincidentally met Gina before I ever met Jennifer back in the 90s. To be able to reunite that cast and work with them is kind of a queer fever dream come true, honestly. It is nice seeing all your sweet faces. Former 90s teen dream and current 40-something hunk Devin Sawa has been a critical part of the Chucky TV show in multiple roles. Way before Chucky came his way, he was already a major name in the horror genre, as he starred in 1999's Idle Hands and 2000's Final Destination, as well as the lesser-known and more recent fright flick Hunter Hunter. In season one of Chucky, Sawa plays Jake's angry, abusive father Lucas, as well as Jake's angry, differently abusive uncle Logan. Chucky manipulates Lucas's bad treatment of Jake to try and bring out some homicidal tendencies in the kid, though he has slightly more success elsewhere in the family. Sawa returned for season two as Father Bryce, a Catholic priest whom Chucky manages to get quite close to in the end. As the actor explained to Entertainment Tonight, this new guy is less toxic than the first two guys, but he still has some stuff going on. Sawa is also set to return for season three in a whole new venue for Chucky to haunt, specifically the White House, as the actor is now going to play the President of the United States. We sure hope he keeps the nuclear launch codes on the highest shelf in the Oval Office. Let's just see the Oval Office. Even though Chucky has made the move to TV, he certainly isn't ready for primetime. The devilish doll has quite the famously filthy vocabulary, after all, and Don Mancini wouldn't have it any other way. The writer credits NBC's Hannibal, another movie-to-TV franchise that he worked on, for inspiring Chucky's scurry to the small screen, as well as helping keep the show true to its R-rated roots. As he explained to Entertainment Weekly, "...before we even sold the show, we had to confirm with the network that Chucky could drop his F-bombs." Mancini noted that Chucky gets a maximum of 10 F-bombs per episode, which stands in stark contrast to what director Steven Spielberg got for Chucky when the doll made a cameo appearance in the 2018 movie Ready Player One. As Mancini recalled, since that was a PG-13, they had one mandated F-bomb at their disposal and Spielberg chose to deploy it with Chucky's appearance, which I loved. Chucky. Chucky is quite the improvisational killer doll. He goes with the flow and uses what resources he has available to him, just like his human counterpart Charles Lee Ray did before him. Now, does this mean that the Child's Play franchise is riddled with certain plot holes and inconsistencies? Sure, but at least those plot holes and inconsistencies are fun, bloody, and bound to give viewers a migraine when explanations are offered decades later. Season 1 of the Chucky TV show does its best to clear up why Charles can seemingly only transfer his soul into good guy dolls. The entire franchise has played with the idea of Chucky drawing on the powers of voodoo and other ill-defined magic to move his rotten soul around like day traders move money. It's also toyed with the concept that Chucky is powered by rage and sacrifice. But the season one finale explains that because Charles Lee Ray used a certain spell in the original Child's Play to transfer his soul into a good guy doll, any time that he uses the same spell afterwards, he must also use an identical garbage pail, so to speak, to house his soul. Does this fully explain why he can sometimes splinter himself up into certain human bodies? Perhaps not, but maybe the writers will explain that in another episode down the line. Or just leave it as a happy and hilarious mystery.
Chucky is a relentless, remorseless killing machine. Even when he was a human, he was depraved and destructive. So could there have ever truly been a time when Chucky was good? The answer is kind of, and it happens in season two of the Chucky TV show. In this chapter of the franchise, Jake and his friends capture Chucky and try to brainwash his violent tendencies away. It's reminiscent of a similar scene in the 1971 film A Clockwork Orange. In the Chucky version, the process actually works, at least for a little while. Good Chucky is sweet, innocent, and so disgusted by violence that it makes him puke. The result is so effective that it even scares the teens. We didn't brainwash him. We brain bleached him. It's a take on the character that Brad Dourif absolutely loves, even if Good Chucky was ultimately destined to break bad again. Still, it might not be curtains for Good Chucky forever, even after all that transpires in season two, as Don Mancini revealed in an interview. I don't know that we've necessarily seen the last of him, just because I think I may need to see more of that. Just because I enjoy it, you know? And I know Brad enjoys it. To promote season three of the Chucky TV show, the killer doll has hosted a press conference, and it's exactly as vulgar as you'd expect. In the clip, Chucky takes to the too tall podium to address a very curious press corps. This latest batch of episodes is set in Washington, D.C., and stars Devin Sawa as the President of the United States, though Chucky refuses to acknowledge that he even knows who the actor is. Will Devin Sawa be returning as a new character? Ooh. Chucky can't stop slinging sass and profanity at all of the gathered reporters. He's understandably grumpy as the announcement is cutting into his precious time for terrorizing. He's clearly upping the ante in his fight against Jake Wheeler and friends, and America in general, by moving his headquarters to the nation's capital. However, he refuses to answer almost any of the questions asked of him by the press. For a killer doll who seems to crave attention, he could really stand to brush up on his PR skills. Perhaps the events of season three will include Chucky assembling a communications team of his very own. Maybe he could even take inspiration from Megan and show off a dance that is sure to go viral. Over the years, quite a few things have proven to be true about Chucky, and one in particular is that he's always down to learn something and kill someone new.